Okay. So uh, my name is uh, uh, in French uh, Mathieu Pisanvert, or in English uh, um, Matthew Pisanberg. It's fine too. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, photometric stereo and uh, how we can um, port a photometric stereo algorithm that are written in Rust uh, to the web. And so. Um, uh, most of this work has been funded by a French agency, uh, Ainer, and uh, I'm working at uh, Normandy University. So, and some of the images are from the Bio Museum. So these are the the logo about this. Yeah. Um, so quickly, I'm going to present uh, three things. First, uh, quick tower about three re reconstruction. Uh, we've already had a bit of background with the present presentations. Uh, then a little bit of uh, what is uh, photometric stereo, and finally, how do we uh, code this in Rust and how do we port it to the web? So 3D reconstructions from images. So like we saw in the different in the previous uh, presentation, um, what most people think of when we say 3D reconstruction from images are things that looks like that and which are basically um, aiming at reconstructing uh, something in the real world, uh, usually buildings, cities, things like that, uh, from a sequence of uh, images. But uh, you have to know that it's not at all the, the only thing that we can do and the kind of reconstruction that we can have. In fact, uh, when you look at, for example, uh, medical images, you can do a lot of uh, 3D reconstruction on subjects with uh, tomography and with uh, a lot of data that is not from images from the real world. And like this is also a kind of 3D reconstruction that exists, but uh, it will, we'll not talk about that uh, today. Um, amongst the, the most common 3D reconstruction approaches, I would say, uh, the the two main one are um, the branch of uh, photogrammetry, structure from motion, and visual slam that uh, uh, Jordan just presented before. Uh, there is also another branch uh, that is using a different kind of sensors, uh, usually sensors that emit uh, information, like they emit lights in a structured way or uh, in a different way where they just uh, measure uh, times uh, for light that is going out and coming back to the sensors. And in those kind of situations, usually you only need one image because you are measuring depth information uh, directly with the sensor. And it's a different problem, but it's also something you can use for 3 reconstruction. And finally, what I want to talk about today is the subject of uh, photometric stereo. So contrary to photogrammetry, photometric stereo doesn't use a moving camera. So it's, uh, it's maybe a little less uh, intuitive because we are not uh, focusing on the geometry aspects, but on the photometric aspect of the information. So what the lights what the intensity of the light from the image can give us uh, as information. So we will use multiple images like in photogrammetry, but the camera will be fixed. And what we want to change is the lighting of the scene. So instead of moving the camera, we change the lighting. A little bit of context and photo on uh, uh, photometric stereo. Um, the interpretation of uh, images uh, to have an idea about the, the shape that is represented by images is something that our brain is able to do, but we have to keep in mind that it's something that uh, can be interpreted in different ways. So. I've put here an images, which is uh, representing um, some kind of 
gray level pixels. And the idea is uh, if you had to say what is the 3D shape behind this image, what would you think it is? And actually, if we are considering the fact that images are the process of capturing and projecting information, we can have multiple interpretations of this uh, image. Um, typically, uh, there are three main factors uh, for the formation of this image. There is the geometry, which can be, which correspond to the explanation of the sculpture here. There is the, the pigments, the, the colors of the thing we are observing, which can be the interpretation of the painter here. And there is how objects are lighted. Um, so depending on which light to project to an object on an object, it may be it may appear differently on your sensor. So we have to know that if we only know uh, if we don't know any of this information, we don't have enough prior to know exactly which of these is the reason why we are observing an image. So when we are trying to rebuilding an information from a 2D image, we have to take into account those three information. Uh, knowing this, um, there is um, a field of, uh, of uh, 3D reconstruction that uh, is one of the early field uh, that is using um, the light information, which is called shape from shading. And the idea is that uh, you can estimate the appearance of a surface that doesn't have any shiny components. So a surface that is called uh, lumbersion. That's something that uh, Jordan uh, mentioned before. Um, as a surface that will reflect light, that will um, re-emit light uh, proportionally um, to the angle regarding the lights. So if you have one light in the scene and you are looking at a point that uh, is oriented toward this light, it will appear more bright than a point that is with a bigger angle between the surface of observation and the direction of the light. And if you have uh, more if you have uh, more curves, you can even have a situation where the object is casting self shadows, where a part of an object is not lighted anymore by source. And so if you use this model to um, try to interpret how light, is, uh, how light appears on your image, uh, you get to the Lambert law, which says that the intensity of an image at coordinates uh, u and v depends on the albedo, uh, which we will use the the letter rho, rho the Greek letter rho is here. I don't know how to pronounce that in English. I just say so, rho in French. <laughs> and then you have the the dot product between the direction of the light and the surface normal. So that's for each pixel. Uh, obviously, if you are trying to retrieve the, the direction of the normal, um, you have here uh, three unknowns for these vectors, and you only have one information, which is the intensity on one image. So you cannot uh, you cannot find the the direction of the normal if you have only have this information, or you have to do other hypotheses. But if you say that instead of one image, you are going to look at multiple images at the same position, uh, that's where things get interesting. So in this slide here, you can see on the left, I have put a tiny sh um, shiny spot on the left, then on the center, and then on the right of our uh, rusty mascots. And um, the idea is that if you are looking at the same pixels, uh, with different lighting information. The only thing that is 
uh, changing here between the images is the lighting. So the the albedo of each pixel is some information that is associated to the physical value of the object you're observing. And the normals is not changing between different images. So if you are in a setup where you have calibrated your, your lighting, so you know where is the light coming from for each image, you are in a situation where the only thing you don't know is the, is the, the albedo and the orientation of the surface. And if you have enough images, at least three, uh, you can reconstruct those, you can get those two information back. You can write this uh, in a matrix form, but yeah, let's skip that. So this is one of the examples of uh, three reconstruction you can get. And it's to say that the resolution of the 3D reconstruction really mainly depends only on the resolution of your uh, image sensor. So if you are taking something from far away, uh, you will get the resolution of one pixel per geometry. And it's the same if you are taking something from very near, from very close position. So depending on where you can uh, place your sensor um, and how far it can be of the object you are trying to reconstruct, the resolution depends only on that. So it's um, a very neat technique to try to do three reconstruction in macro photography. And some people are using it, for example, for uh, estimating skin defects or things like that. Here, uh, it's a different setting. Uh, it's the it's a captation of uh, the bio tapestry. If uh, some of you are familiar with uh, with this uh, piece of art, it's a um, it's a um, it's an embroidery that is a thousand years old, and that's exposed at the Bayeux Museum in France. And it it basically um, retraces uh, how uh, Guillaume. Uh, Le Conquérant, Guillaume Le Normand, uh, invaded uh, England to like, be the first uh, Norman king of, uh, um, of uh, the, uh, England. So yeah, it's a, it's a passionate story. But um, so um, the thing is, uh, we are interesting in this project in uh, uh, trying to do 3D reconstruction of uh, this um, uh, embroidery. And uh, so we have been using uh, photometric stereo for, for that. And as you can see here, uh, there are a few different images here where uh, you can see the embroidery at the, in, the, in the middle of the image and at the corners, you can see some shiny balls that we have been placing on the um, and the glass that is protecting the embroidery. And we are using those balls to do the light calibration and estimate the orientation of the light for each image. Here is another image in a different, with a different uh, light orientation, and then another one. And if you take a few of these, in practice, we have taken, uh, I think, 12 for each scene. You can get reconstruction uh, that looks like this. So that's uh, photometric stereo. And now how are we doing this in, in Rust and how are we porting this to the web? So I have a little demo here. Uh, it's a demo of a web application that he's using all that I just presented. And uh, uh, here it's running in localhost, but uh, you can you can really run it, run it on yourself. I will show the link at the end of the presentation. Um, so here we are loading a few images. So I'm loading images here, and when I'm doing that, what it is doing, it's it is uh, actually using the image crates. Uh, from the Rust community, and it's uh, decoding 
every image that I am passing to the interface. So it's taken a bit of time because uh, these are rather uh, big images. These are something like uh, uh, 26 megapixel images, something like that. So it's taking a bit of time, but it's uh, running in the in the browser. And then I'm dropping uh, the lights, the lights configuration that is that contains the information about uh, where are the images located. Uh, we can see the different images here in the interface um, that have been loaded by the, the REST application. And I can access the different parameters of the algorithm here. I will just keep it with the default for now. You can have some information about which parameters are which. And I will just select a little bit of the little part of the of the scene, and I will ask for a 3D reconstruction of this. So the algorithm has started. It is um, trying to build a reconstruction, and then it has finished, and it has made available the normal maps. And here you can see that we have reconstructed the the, we have re retrieved the directions of uh, the, the the directions of uh, the normals for each pixel, and once you have that, you can do some kind of integration to retrieve the the actual uh, surface three surface. But uh, that's again another thing. Uh, so let's go back to the presentation. So how is organized the code for, for this? So uh, what I have found to be working well is to be very organized with uh, how you, um, where you put your code. So basically, I've been uh, splitting myself, splitting my code in uh, four different uh, uh, directories. The first one will contain the core parts of the algorithm uh, as the Rust library. So these are the main things. And if possible, with the less number of dependencies, uh, so that it's really really only the core part of the algorithm. Then usually I have a, a binary um, uh, crate, which, is, which contains uh, a CLI uh, executable, so that I can try stuff on the CLI uh, to do some examples and verify that what I'm coding in the library is actually working. And finally, I have a, a repository with a WASM uh, library and a front-end application. So what does the library code looks like? So it's what you could expect. I'm using uh, an algebra for most of the computations. And so uh, basically what you have here is some kind of configuration where I'm saying uh, the different configuration of the algorithms, like how many iterations, what are the different conversion threshold, what is the estimated uh, mean depth of the, of the image at the beginning, and what are the direction of the lights, the calibration, the light calibration. And then the interface of the photometric stereo function it's just it takes a config, it takes a bunch of uh, images, and it outputs the reconstruction, the three models, the normals, and the albedo. And the normals is the one that I showed in the application. So in the library config, I'm trying to put, uh, keep everything as minimalist as possible, uh, which means, for example, uh, in the image, um, in the image dependency, I'm uh, setting all the default uh, features to false because actually I'm not performing any any uh, actual encoding or decoding or stuff like that. I'm just using the the bare types of the image crate, so keeping this minimal. Uh, also, I have Wasm Wasm here, which is used for generating. Um, Interop, 
with with uh, WebAssembly, but I only want that to be active when I am actually compiling the the WASM binary and not when I'm compiling, for example, the CLI binary. So keep it optional as well. And same for CERDA. Then for the WebAssembly configuration, you can have the information about how uh, to set up everything uh, in the WebAssembly guide. But basically, as a quick uh, reminder, you have um, uh, a config.toml with you where you set up that the create type is a, a dynamic library and rlib. I don't remember what it's about. Then you have a dependency on your core library. You add the features that you need for everything to work. You optionally add also features on other dependencies that you need. For example, in the image, I added JPEG and PNG features because I want to be able to decode the uh, JPEG images and be careful uh, not adding the JPEG uh, uh, multi-threaded one because it will crash and uh, wasn't so. And yeah, so that's that's more of it. And one very important thing is that you want to have uh, this dependency that enables better error messaging when uh, the WASM code is panicking because it will panic a lot and you will have to figure out what is going wrong. Um, once you've done that, uh, you need a way to communicate between your REST WebAssembly library, uh, some JavaScript code, uh, which is used for your front end. And what I recommend is usually to go for a web worker. It's basically an emulation of a thread, but um, the main advantage of doing that is that you are not uh, taking control of the main thread while the REST code is running, the WebAssembly code is running. Because usually, as computer vision like aficionados, we are uh, trying to run code that might run for a long time. And so if you're doing this in the main thread, uh, you are um, the, the interface is not responsive anymore. And you don't want that because uh, you will think that it has crashed, the browser will think that it has crashed, and after a few seconds, it will tell you that you need to close the, the, uh, close the, the web page or things like that. But actually, you just have to wait a little bit. So that's why I recommend going from a, for a worker setup for the REST web assembly. Um, and uh, that will be probably another talk for another meetup, but uh, um, when you're doing that, um, you have to know that um, uh, you will want eventually to have an async version of your algorithm. And that is because you will want to be able to stop the algorithm some way. Uh, which is not possible in WebAssembly running in a worker. Uh, in, that's the main difference between when you run stuff in, a, in, a, in, the, in the CLI, where you can just control C and it will stop everything. And in the, in the web worker, if you want to stop the algorithm, the only thing you can do if it's not uh, set up in a good way is to close the web page. And uh, then you lose everything. Like, all the setup you did, like loading the images and everything. So, yeah, uh, there is a little bit of, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of stuff uh, about how to set up uh, WebAssembly codes that is taking a lot of time. But yeah, we can leave that for another moment. And um, yeah, so that's just uh, another view of what looks like from the worker JavaScript module. You have to know that the worker JavaScript module that is loading the WebAssembly code um, uh, cannot uh, be used directly uh, in a worker as is, because um, worker um, do not web workers do not support uh, ES modules, and the way your WebAssembly bundle will be, will be compiled is as an ES module. 
So if you want to be able to use your WebAssembly bundle, you will need another step with the tools with something like ESBuild that will take your bundle and output everything in a non-module file that will gather everything you need in one file. So yeah, when you once you've done that, you have you you make available an initialization function that will initialize the data that you need. And then the main idea is that you listen to messages and once a message arrives asking to run the algorithm, then you just run it. And that's yeah, that's pretty much all. Uh, thank you. And you can have the code uh, located here. And um, uh, I'd like to mention that uh, the initial um, algorithm that I've been using is uh, coming from the uh, PhD thesis of uh, Ivan Keo, and that the web application has been made in collaboration has been in collaboration with uh, Florian Vincent, uh, who was uh, doing an internship uh, in our um, group. So yeah, that's all. I will stop sharing. <laughs>